Do you know that we are products or that you are a product of all of your past decisions? Yep, have a look at yourself. You are a product of all of your past decisions. You are the sum total of all the choices you have made up to this point of time. And what you decide today, what I decide, what we decide today can determine who we will become tomorrow. The series that we're doing is a series called I Choose. Four messages. I'm kicking it off. And today, I want to share on I Choose purpose over popularity. To outwork God's purposes, the big purposes and the small purposes, His purposes in and through my life, rather than seeking the popularity of the people around about me or even the society that I live in. Imagine a world, just imagine your world, just now, just just click on the TV screen, ding, the television of your imagination. Is it on? Just imagine this, go with me, that everyone in your world really likes you. That everyone in your world just so approves of you. And that everyone just admires you. Isn't that a fantastic false picture? (laughs) It's just not possible. And it will never, ever happen to you. That's bad news, isn't it? No, it's real news. Now let's turn on another screen. Click. Not SBS, this is your screen. Imagine a world where you don't care that much about what other people think because you're so focused on pleasing God and people's approval around about you doesn't affect you or doesn't consume you. Now, that's a better image, don't you reckon? I like that image. I think that's, that's that's a beauty. Better that one than the first one. One of the biggest choices you can make is to choose purpose over popularity and to live by your principle-oriented passions. And I mean passions and principles that are biblically grounded, that are Christ-centered, that are people-loving, that are about not self-absorption, but trying to live a selfless life for Jesus' glory and to add value to people's lives. Principle-oriented passions. Many of us, sadly, by default, we choose the opposite. Popularity above outworking God's purposes. One day I'm going through it. This is, this is experience happened to me about uh, just 20 years ago. And I'm having a pity party on my own because there were people out there that I found out didn't like me. Is it hard to believe? <laughs> More than that, they were saying some stuff and and uh, just behaving in ways that were, I felt, pretty cruel and, and, uh, and not right. And so I'm really, really uh, feeling it a bit. And, uh, you know, with the critics, with what was happening going down, and then I read this scripture, and it blew me over, and it ministered to me. Because the, Jesus had some critics, Pharisees, and another group called the Herodians, who were followers of Herod. They were religious people, but they followed King Herod, who was not a Jew, he was an Edomite, who the Romans put in to oversee Palestine, and, uh, but he was a nasty piece of works and uh, a very cruel man. Uh, he had his wife murdered, had two of his sons killed, he just killed a lot of people. And, um, and so uh, these Herodians were political religious people that were attacking Jesus. And uh, they, they're trying to trick him. And they want to trick him about loyalty to Caesar, because they're Herodians, and so they're following Herod because they worship Caesar. So Caesar was being worshipped as a god, or the beginnings of it. And so uh, they're trying to trick him and say, well, Jesus, you know, here's a coin, you know, uh, who should we give our money to? Um, you know, tell us, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And Jesus gives them a, a fantastic answer. But what grabbed me was what they said about him. These are his fiercest critics. And it was like God said to me, Bill, your fiercest critics, 
They know deep down your heart. Your integrity speaks for itself. Don't worry about what people say. You just follow my example of what integrity is all about and be a person of your word. And this is the, the, the scripture. And the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his own words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity. We know that you're a man of integrity. And that you teach the way of God according, in accordance with the truth. Again, listen to what they're saying. So why don't they bow their knee and submit to him and accept him as the saviour and Lord and receive the gift of eternal life? No, they didn't. Because you aren't swayed by others. Oh, because you pay no attention to who they are. Wow. And I tell you, I'm getting a lot of criticism and, and the popular thing to do was to give in to the popular causes. And the Pentecostal charismatic scene in Australia was being swayed by some emphases of ministry that were just counter to what I believed. And churches are going for it. And the pressure came on for me to go for it too, to interpret my Pentecostal evangelical tradition and values in kind of like, you know, I believe in the fire of the Holy Spirit, but I don't believe in wildfire. I don't believe in bushfires. I just believe it should be channeled. And uh, so the life of the Spirit and the ministry of the Word go together. And so we had people here, I reckon we had 30 people that left the church. And some, one, one person set up a prayer meeting that God would change my heart, heart, that I wouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit anymore. But one man said he saw the Holy Spirit leave the church. Came into my office crying, oh, the Holy Spirit's left the church. And I nearly burst out laughing. And I said, and I, I said well, when did he leave? He goes, last Sunday. <laughs> I said, how do you know? I saw him. I said, well, we're all in trouble. We're, all, we're unsaved. We're going to hell. If we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, he's gone. And, and, and he seriously believed it. He was sincere, but duped by popular opinion to deviate from what the scripture taught and what was centered around Jesus and around values that really were in the best interests of people. And so this little black duck wasn't for turning. And I tell you, there was a lot of opposition and people that should have known better and I'm feeling pretty sorry for myself and then I got this word and I thought, oh Lord, you're so good, you just speak to me at the right time. You see, Jesus was never swayed by popular opinions. He lived by his convictions. He was committed to his purpose. He knew who he was in God. He knew his mission. And it didn't matter what people said. I so want to be like Jesus. What about you? Isn't that scripture when you say, I want to be like you, Jesus. When my kids talk about me, I want them to say that. When my neighbors talk about me, I want them to say that. They may disagree with me. They may oppose me. But I want them to say that. And then Paul, oh, I mean Paul, love Paul. Look at, and he emulated Jesus in this matter. Have a look at what he said to the Greeks in Thessalonica. He said, wonderful statement. And, and, and I mean, ministering to Greeks is not easy. And if you read the second missionary journey, I mean, there was what we say in Greek, fasaria, magali fasaria. It was a big trouble. He's in and out of jail. He's getting beaten up. He's, and it's like, at the end, when he takes off and goes to Corinth, he goes, what the heck was that? Wherever he goes, he's in huge trouble. So he goes back and he starts, he just has a break. He goes back making tents. I think he's having a, a break saying, this is rough. The Asians were, were quite normal and quite rational and had a little bit of trouble, but not like this. And um, so in Thessalonica, he only stayed, I think, three weeks and he had to take off because they're chasing him down. So he takes off to Athens, and that's as hard as can be. No one, very few people could give their lives to Christ in Athens. They're too intellectual. And then he goes to Corinth, and he says, makes tents. And then, then he hears the good news of what happened in Thessalonica, and he starts preaching again in Corinth and spends 18 months there. And Kath and I went to Corinth this year. Amazing place, ancient Corinth. And so um, he writes to the Thessalonians and says this. And I love this. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. Because that's what they were accusing him of. You're a crook. You're saying wrong stuff, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God. Isn't that great? Who tests our heart. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up our greed. He wasn't a slippery political player saying one thing to that group, that constituency, and another thing to that group, and, and trying to win friends and influence people by abandoning his principles. He knew his purpose, and he knew his Bible-centered, Christ-focused principles, and he didn't compromise. 
I love these words. We were not looking for praise from people. He was living before an audience of one. Paul always chose to be a principled and purposeful man above being popular with the people. I so want to follow Paul's example. How about you? Those passages. That's, I want to be like that. I don't care if I'm the most unpopular person out there. I would sooner have my integrity and not have my conscience violated and stay true to the word of God to centre my life around Jesus, to do as much good to my fellow man and, and, and to stick with the main game rather than to be diverted by the opinions and the speculations and, and sometimes the aberrant teachings and methodologies of, of some people who know better. Um, there is power in purpose. There is great power in purpose. Let me give you three things it does. And I'm not just talking about God's big overall purpose for your life. But I'm also talking about God's daily purposes in the moments that you're living in. Today, tomorrow, next day, where you are at school, university, at home, raising kids, a most noble job. Most noble job. Stay at home mums and dads. They're the champions of our society. The grandparents and parents who look after disabled children, they're the champions. Oh, they're gold. And uh, they're out working God's purposes for loving and justice and mercy and care and support. And so uh, God's interested in every dimension of your life. At university this week or at school or at work, wherever you are. So the power of purpose is not just the big overall purpose of God in your life, but it's the daily purposes in those moments that you are living in. And so the power of purpose, the first thing is purpose gives you the focus to diminish distractions. And uh, one of the characters I want to talk about when I go to Papua New Guinea, and I've got a, a, a series of talks, four messages, five messages I'll, I'll be doing with the pastors on, on this character, Nehemiah. Great story. And uh, he's a cupbearer. He brings water to King Artaxerxes. He's a public servant, but he's got a burden in his heart. He's got this terrible discontent. He hears the stories of what's happening back in Judea and uh, the Persians that allowed the, the, the Jews to go back into Jerusalem. They'd been captured by Nebuchadnezzar and, um, and he was an evil man, terrible man. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar kind of, uh, um, and the Babylonians and, and the Assyrians had all captured them and they were doing terrible stuff. And then the Persians took over the Babylonian Assyrian empires and good King Cyrus, which I think we'll see him in heaven. Oh, by the way, we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I mean, he was really bad. Actually, it gives me great encouragement because if it does happen that there is a President Trump, <laughs> if it does happen, read the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He got saved. And he was a terrible man, a thousand times worse than Donald Trump. So if there's hope, I'm just saying that to give you hope, particularly though my American brothers that are here and sisters. Okay, I'm just teasing you now. But Nehemiah, he's feeling this burden and, and the king says, go back. And he goes back and he starts rebuilding the wall because the local crooks, the local gangs were coming in and ransacking Jerusalem because the governor's of the areas around there, Sanballat, the horror night. Isn't that an evil name? Sanballat, the horror of the night. Gresham, Tobiah. And these were governors that were paying lip service to the king of Persia, but they were allowing gangs they had to, to actually come in and ransack to keep Judea in poverty stricken so that they wouldn't rise in economic power because all the trade routes would go through there from the Tigris-Euphrates Valley through to Nile. And so they were attacking them. And so Nehemiah's he's trying to build this wall and he's got these people attacking him, both with words and actions. And so he's up there on the wall. He's building it. He's got a sword in one hand. He's got a trowel in the other. And he's got the sword next to him like this and he's watching. He grabs the rock, puts it up cement and he picks up the sword like he's working he's warring and he's worshipping as he's doing it he's praying he's an amazing guy just shoots up his prayers to God he hasn't got time to get on his knees and have an hour prayer meeting he's just he's just working and warring and shooting prayers and his prayers are oh Jesus have mercy oh God give it to them in the neck something like that you know like remember me they're bad I'm good I'm trying to do your will just simple prayers Anyway, Sanballat, 
And Gresham, and these guys come up and say, you, you think you are? You little man. And they're cursing him and they're saying, you know what? Look at those rocks, they're burnt. He goes, just a little breeze is going to come and knock them over. And, 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 and they're abusing him. And they're taunting him. Do you know what he does? He just says, I'm not listening. And he kept on doing it. I'm not listening. I am doing a great work. Picking up a rock. Building a wall. I'm out working God's purposes. He's not preaching. He's picking up rocks and putting them on there. Oh, we're going to get you. We're going to knock it over. I'm not listening. I'm not being distracted. I am doing a great work. And then four times they came and harassed him. And they said, come on, Nehemiah. We've got to have a little conference in the valley of Ono. And Nehemiah says, this little black duck is not having any conference. So it's no, no to Ono. No, no, no. Four times. No. I love these words. He says, why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. He wasn't distracted because he knew his purpose. He's not a preacher. He's not a priest. He's a builder. But he's doing something that is really important as God outworks his purposes. And it's how easy it is to be distracted from outworking what God wants us to do. And um, I, I face this in, in my life. I still get the temptation to be distracted, but I know when I, as a young Christian, I'm 17, 18 years of age, and I've, I've come to Christ, and um, at 19, I'm, I'm going to go to university, Flinders Uni, and then to do Bible college. But the pull of the sporting fraternity that I was in I was best in my sport at 14 years of age, under 23. So I was the state snooker champion. And people were looking at this, this Bill, Billy Vasilakis. Watch him when he goes into the snooker hall. He's a shark. I used to play with my left hand to make out I was weak. And they'd say, oh, he's weak. Let's put 20 bucks on him. I'd play with my right hand and clean him up and win money. That's the way I... <laughs> I'm not proud of that, but I did earn a lot of money. And uh, before I got saved, then I got saved, all that stopped, just to be qualified that. But seriously, I remember they're saying, Bill, you're in the A grade division, the state championship state, we want you in. And I'm being pulled. I loved the game. I felt though the desire in my heart was, loose, was lessening because I wanted to study God's word. And so the choice was four nights a week Bible college as well as the university and during the day to study the word, to sit under Leo Harris and Barry Chant and Ken Chant. And the guys are coming to me, the Paul. It was a mighty distraction. Bill, come down to the valley of Ono. Let's, it's a beautiful table there. The, the cues are, are, are terrific and, and everyone loves you and they're looking to you to be the, you could be the state champion, you could become the Australian, you could turn professional and make a lot of money. Talk like that. It was a distraction. Sport's not evil. It was a good thing. In fact, I, I kind of gave it up for about 10 years until uh, I'm having holidays and I still remember this and Kathy probably doesn't remember it, but I'm home and I've got no one to boss around, like I'm on holiday. So what do you do? Well, you take charge of the kitchen. You boss her around, like, you know, the washing and that. And she said, go and get your snooker cue and go down the snooker hall and leave me alone. <laughs> and at times she would say, just take your cue and go, will you? And God gave it back to me, purified of selfish ambition as a genuine sport. And I love the game. I enjoy the game now, watching and playing. But... It was a distraction at that time that could have, and if I gave into that and didn't do Bible college and outwork his purposes, I'd hate to think of where my life was. So even a good thing like sport, I'm not saying you should give up your sport. I'm not saying you should give up anything. I'm saying when you know your purposes in God and, and when you're being led by him, you've got to listen to his voice, whether it's work, whether it's family entanglements, um, to not deviate and be distracted. And I know when I was teaching several years later, and I'm leading the church in 1979, I came in 1978, it's not a large group, but it started to grow, and the church could afford to put me on half a salary. So I'm, I still remember Mr. Mewden at Mewden College, beautiful man. 
and he um, gave me a job. I was, I was cleaning toilets with three university degrees. I'm a toilet cleaner. <laughs> like a toilet cleaner, the worst toilets in the world, four hours a day at a drive-in theatre. Gross. Gross. You've got to believe what people do at drive-in theatres. And I had to clean all that mess up. It was just unbelievable. Like, ugh, <laughs> to earn some money. So I'm cleaning these toilets and everything, and I'm, I'm a teacher. So I'm applying everywhere for jobs, and no one, except he rings me up and says, oh, we've got a job for... An hour a day. I'm like, just an hour? I find out one hour is earning more than four hours telling toilets. I could park my car in Sturt Street, the, 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 the church, the CRC church, and just walk there. He was a wonderful man. And I loved teaching there for three years. And that final year, 1979, I had a whole bunch of, uh, 78, 79, a whole bunch of kids, all of them matriculated. And, uh, and at the end, Mr. Mutant said to me, we want you to stay. You're one of our best teachers. And there were some teachers that were just you know, slackers and kids were failing because we want you to stay and the pull, the pull to stay and the, the, the financial package looked really good and I'm sorry, Milan, it looked better than what the church offered me. <laughs> so there, there. I also had the adulation of the principal. All the little girls were in love with me as the teacher. They liked, they all came to our wedding. And what, you know, just the, you know, they, the parents loved me. The girls, they mostly were girls. They, they had crushes on me. It was ridiculous. I mean, like, but you know what? Popularity. I felt it. I'm accepted. I'm loved. They like me. There's lots of good money there. And then there's the church. Working. Serving. Choice was very simple for me. I had to outwork God's purposes, but I tell you what, I understood the tug and the pull of what can take place. Are you being distracted by something that's an enticement? It could even be a good thing that's stopping you, hindering you from outworking God's purposes in your life, with your family. Secondly, power of purpose. Purpose gives you the focus to diminish distractions it gives you the strength to push through the pain barrier. The pathway to your purpose is paved with pain. Read the Bible. Moses, David, Nehemiah, Esther, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus himself. The pain, the difficulties that they went through. But the Lord gives us the, the strength to push through the barrier. Look at the Apostle Paul. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow, my grace is sufficient for you. He gives us the strength and all the difficulties that he faced. When you're doing what God calls you to do, some people won't like it and they won't understand. But my mum and dad, when I became a pastor, uh, they their disappointment, they didn't have to say it. But as traditional Greek parents who put their kid through university and, and for me to, to, to become a pastor of a church of a handful of people with uh, just a little salary, it was almost inconceivable. And I know they were disappointed. And that pained me greatly, though they never said anything. Later, they were pleased and very proud of me. And thankfully, they came to Christ and they ended. They were sitting there in the church here they, and they, they're in heaven today. You see, purpose pushes you through the pain. And, uh, and there will be pain when you're doing God's purposes. How do you handle the critics? Some people will not like you. Some things are not easy to do. But purpose pushes you on. Some things are hard and purpose, unless you're purposeful, you cave in. Critics can't stop you. Obstacles can't stop you. Opposition won't deter you. Pain won't slow you. Remember that what Jesus went through, what pain he went through to, to save us, the suffering he experienced, the cruel death on a cross where my sin, your sin was placed upon him to be able to reconcile us to the Father. To, to introduce us to, the, to him and to receive the gift of eternal life to live forever. He went through so much suffering. And uh, when I remember what pain he went through to save me, it helps me to stay centred on serving him and not giving up. 
That's why you get up earlier and serve the Lord. You work harder. You stay up later. Your God-given purpose drives you. When you think you can't do something, with Christ you can. When you feel that you won't be able to, with Christ you will. Purpose gives you the strength to push through unbelievable and difficult, painful times. In, in your living your life, it can be extremely difficult raising children. If God has called you to raise kids, that's your purpose. That's your purpose in life, to raise them, to give your best to them and not to be distracted by other things. And uh, I loved the interview I, I saw the other day of Melinda Gates. And uh, Melinda, she's a top executive. She meets Bill because she's basically the number one person in the company. Like, she's a brilliant person. And she's got huge numbers of staff. They end up marrying. And before they married, they'd worked out, get this. They worked out two things. One, she's going to be a stay-at-home mum. How's that? I made that decision. She goes, and I will go back at the right time. Secondly, I'm going to give all our money away. Just happened to be 60 billion. And she hasn't deviated from it. Strong Catholic tradition. And, and it's like she and her husband, I mean, what a mate. I'm thinking, why don't they choose her or him to become president of the United States? I mean, like, give me a break. She'd run rings around Hillary and Donald. Magnificent. I'm thinking, man, what a human being who's centered, loves God, loves people, is not attached to money, loves her kids. And yet she was pulled. Even her husband, Bill said, Are you sure? You know, like, you're so good. No, no. I'm looking after my kids. That's my purpose. So all through the dirty nappies and all those difficult periods, you've got to look at the end result, what you're producing, magnificent human beings, great citizens that can change the world. That's as important as me preaching the gospel to you. That's as important as you being a teacher. There's nothing wrong with women who've got babies and kids to do work, but you've got to do the will of the Lord and let him speak to you and work. Let him work through you. Do his will. Outwork his purpose. I remember in, in raising the four kids, I used to try and get home early. And so I, I, there were times when I'd be home at 4.30 each day and there was so much work to do. Give Kathy a break and I'd have probably four hours with the children, sort of playing with them, bathing them, putting them to bed, saying devotions. And then I'd have, that's when I'd start my other meetings for 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night through to 11.30. And I remember Bill Osborne said to me, I don't know if Billy's here today, but Bill just made this comment to me in the busyness of life. He says, Bill, nobody else can do it for you. You only have one chance to raise your kids. And he said to me, I made the decision that I'm going to be at home. I'm serving the Lord. I'm purposeful. I'm committed. But I'm going to be at home and I'm going to be the best dad that I can be. Oh, wow. That spoke to me. I thought, that's true. I tried to emulate that. Remember David Smythe saying to me that when his dad died and he came and preached the next morning at church, he died Saturday night and he's up preaching. I said, David, what are you doing here? You should have told me. I would have taken on. He goes, no, 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 I'm here to preach. He goes, I won't stay afterwards. I said, you okay? Like I'm thinking I'd be a crying, blubbering mess. He goes, no, no, I'm fine. And he said, Bill, he goes, um, I've said everything I want to say to dad and I've done everything I want to do. There's been no unfinished business. He just happens to be in heaven this morning. Oh, I thought, that's God speaking. I thought, they want to be like that. Purposeful. Nothing left unsaid. I've said what I want to say. I've done what I want to do. He's gone. I can continue serving God. That was like, wow. So Bill and David were great role models for me. And we need those role models, don't we? And, and to, to outwork God's purpose in the now. Finally, purpose gives you the courage to please God. When Pharaoh tried to stop Moses, Moses wasn't deterred. Read the story. When the people complained, criticized, rebelled, even his family and friends, Moses stayed on task. Purpose gives you the courage to please God. Remember Peter and the apostles? What did the religious leaders say to them? They lined them up and said, we want you to stop speaking in that name. They couldn't even utter it. What name? Jesus. Oh, don't use that name. Even today, you can watch television programs and you can read things in the paper 
And they can talk about the other being, the higher power, the spiritual vibe. Let's talk about it. But the moment you mention Jesus, hackles go up and it shuts down. Why? Because there's no other name given under heaven on earth by which you can be saved outside of the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is unique. He is exclusive. There is no salvation outside of faith in Christ. And so that's why they said, shut up. Don't use that name. And the same thing's returning now in our 21st century. People are scared of him because there's no neutrality with him. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or it's a legend, or he's the Lord of life. And I discovered as a teenage boy that he is the Lord of life and he deserves to be followed. And I will follow his purposes in my marriage, in my child rearing. To be the best husband I can be, to be the best dad, to be the best granddad. I'm going to Papua New Guinea on Wednesday. Yet I've made a decision. I mean, I said to Amari the other day, I said, I'm going to take you to school, honey, for the next two mornings, Monday and Tuesday morning. Pick her up, have breakfast with me, take her to school, do some reading there, so I can have some input with her. You might think, Bill, you should be preparing the, the studies for... That can wait to the plane. See, if you know your purpose, you realise your time with your wife, your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your neighbours, you, it, it provides, but don't get distracted. We can't please everyone, folks, but we can please God. Look what Peter and the other apostles replied to these religious guys. We must obey God rather than human beings. I choose purpose over popularity. Do you choose purpose over popularity? To trust him to come what may. And without faith, Hebrew says, it's impossible to please God. Look at Moses. I love this little bit in Hebrews 11:26. 26. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Hey, there is value in being liked by people. Come on. But there is greater value in being loved by God. There is value in comfort. But there's greater value in outworking the calling of God upon your life. There is value having fun with friends. But there is greater value being faithful to the God of love who sacrificed his life for us. There is value in starting something important. But I tell you, there's greater value in finishing it for God's glory. There is value in being popular. But there is much greater value in serving God's purposes. Be faithful, church, family, and friends, in the moment. Stay on course to doing God's will. Like I said, raising kids and you're up to your neck in nappies. It's awful. But you're doing a great work. It's going to have a tremendous payoff later when you know your purpose. <laughs> Getting out of debt. You know, I think, how boring. I tell you, sacrificing every day. Making sure, and some of you do it so well. You're saying, we're not going to let the banks control our lives. We're going to live frugally. We're going to pay off our debts step by step, inch by inch, because the payoff is fantastic. The reward at the end is magnificent. You know, people that foster children, it can sometimes be the hardest thing in the world. And maybe some of you here ought to consider that. Because I'll tell you what, our society is going down the tube if we don't look after the children that have no parents and that. And, uh, you know, we buried Rose Denton at the funeral service here on Tuesday, last Tuesday. And to have all her kids up here and, and their, their spouses was just moving. I was weeping there as they're sharing about their mum. And uh, then I met Michael, the little boy that had 30 foster parents, 28 different foster parents. And Rose and Terry fostered that little boy. And you know what they then did? They kept him and adopted him. And you saw him, this great big strapping boy, you know, and he's weeping as his mum has gone to be with the Lord. And, and I just thought, man, what a magnificent heritage. Man, she's a hero. Her reward and Terry's just for doing that. It's going to be much bigger than mine. Seriously. People who do that, there. 
magnificent. They're heroes. And there are so many children out there that need support. And maybe there could be half a dozen of you that could consider actually fostering a child or just having your home available or possibly even adopting a child. They need it. They need love. They need security. They need strength. Living for Jesus is something that some people just don't understand, but you can't please them. You are today, as I said to start with, the sum total of the choices you made in the past. The decisions you make today and can determine who you become and what you can be tomorrow. So I choose purpose over being popular with people. There is great power in purpose. It gives you the focus to eliminate distractions. It gives you the strength to push through pain. It gives you the courage to please God. Folks, you can't please everyone, but you can please God. You can't please everyone, but you can please God. And that's living a life of epic proportions that's going to resonate for the rest of eternity. Can you say amen to that? Yes. 